All right. Well, uh, like we talked, I'll do a couple couple softball questions, sort of break the ice and, and get the conversation going. And since we are at a Platform One Summit, you know, I'll open with the obvious question here. Sort of how is the Jake and Platform One collaborating together? Sort of what's that relationship look like? Um, and what do you think it's going to look like moving forward? Wow. Uh, yeah, that was super softball. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Tyler. <laughs> Great to be here. I uh, just wanted to point out to everyone, I'm wearing my awesome and dressed up for the occasion, wearing my uh, Jake uh, hoodie here. This is a limited edition. Uh, so if you join the Jake, for those of you who are interested, uh, you get one of these uh, as part of the uh, onboarding. So uh, let me start by talking about what the Jake, uh, some of the key sort of projects and products that we build, and then talk about Platform One in that context. So. Uh, as you know, the, the Jake's role at the DOD is sort of being the central organizing sort of, uh, you know, uh, organization for pulling and, you know, creating and scaling AI for the Department of Defense. Now, one of the key, um, one of the key founding principles that when Congress created and helped create uh, the Jake was the concept of a AI development platform and environment called the JCF, the Joint Common Foundations. And so the JCF is actually written into the literally the, the constitution of the Jake in terms of creating it. Now, we as an organization don't own or control cloud or infrastructure across the DOD. And that's where the role of Platform One and Cloud One and, and basically the enabling infrastructure and services that underpin all of the development work inside the DOD. It's something that obviously Platform One and the team are doing in an incredibly great way. Um, just seeing how that has evolved and the thinking and the and the fires burning in terms of uh, DevOps and, and, and development environments and things, having that there. So we view Platform One, believe it or not, as the, 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 the name says, as a platform. They are the foundational sort of piece that we're building the JCF on. Now the JCF is designed to be portable because we don't believe that there's going to be a single you know, environment across the entire DOD for doing AI development. So the JCF is going to be a set of services, whether it be data services, whether it be tooling, libraries, et cetera, that all come together, but then live on top of a platform and inherit a lot of the uh, DevOps functionality that the underlying platform will give us. We're just gonna specialize it for AI uh, on the JCI. So that's awesome. And it, I, I love the the portability and recognizing that we're going to have different environments. You know, <clears throat> as we take that concept and sort of that portability, and you talked about sort of the J Constitution and your role in not only helping to sort of evangelize artificial intelligence across the department, but actually start bringing product and shipping product out. How are you working with organizations or how is the Jake helping to educate sort of what is AI and what is isn't AI? Um, getting them to understand those actual use cases. Yeah, so this is um, this has been an incredibly, uh, the, the most probably challenging part of standing up the Jake. Um, you know, the Jake is a relatively small organization inside this huge, huge, huge DOD. I mean, DOD ranges, I, I don't even know people have an exact head count of what constitutes a DOD, right? Some people tell me it's 2 million people, I hear 2.5 million, I hear 3 million, but anything over, you know, a couple of hundred thousand is big. Uh, we're, a, you know, we're, a, you know, a, from a full-time perspective, about 80 employees and then, you know, with contractors and, and other, you know, vendors, et cetera, probably 150, 170. So it's a smaller organization with a limited budget. So one of the core concepts uh, that we've developed inside from an operating plan perspective, and, uh, and as many of you know or don't, uh, I took over from General Shanahan, who's a retired three-star general now, a uh, legend in the Air Force, was the founder of sort of AI, both Project Maven and Jake at the DOD. Um, we spent an ama enormous amount of time thinking through how we take these limited resources, these small concepts, and lever them into something big. So how do we get a 10 to 20 to 100x leverage over every dollar of work and investment that we make? And so the way we think about it, and then the Jake has a span of control that focuses all the way from policy uh, you know, we own uh, building AI policy ethics, uh, 3000.09, which is obviously governs autonomous, uh, you know, lethal weapon systems, uh, all the way to acquisition. How do we actually acquire products? We have training uh, and education uh, equities, 
And then of course, NMIs, the JCF, both at the infrastructure level and then products that we build. So what we've done here is we, we reorganized or organized the Jake as you would in Silicon Valley as an enterprise software company. Uh, my background was 26 plus years in the Valley, uh, you know, built four startups in the enterprise infrastructure software space. And what typically always worked well was a group of domain experts who understand the customer incredibly well. So think of them as an enterprise sales team, but here we call it a missions team. And we have uh, very senior, uh, you know, O6s, colonels, uh, you know, and, and other sort of military, um, you know, well-trained military, uh, you know, um, colleagues who understand and know the services, right? And the combatant commands. So we engage with the combatant commands and the services in a very deep way, understand their needs and requirements, the strategy, we connect it to the national defense strategy, the NDAA, the other pieces there. So that becomes our guiding light, both between the foundational documents, the strategy and the customers. And just like any other great enterprise software company, we're pulling that information in, bring that back to a well-versed products group. And our products group is consisting of what you would again uh, imagine in a large enterprise software company. We have product managers, we have product project managers, they write PRDs. We happen to contract out our engineering work, but very similar to how we actually operate, we very tightly integrated with our vendors and work very closely with them. And then we've got an AI and data science team, we've got a test and evaluation team, a very strong one, and then of course the JCF team. So you've really got these two halves that integrate together in a very tight way and that's actually how we sort of try to produce the magic. No, it's, it's, it's interesting. You know, we talked earlier about, you know, some of the challenges and the mindset of, of a SaaS sort of approach to, hey, yeah. I can solve it once and scale it 72 a thousand times. Why wouldn't I? Flipping exactly. that on its head a little bit and you look at sort of the broader defense procurement community uh, that might not be as familiar with software development, with machine learning both from a test and evaluation standpoint, but also from a technical procurement standpoint. Right. You know, as much of culture change is occurring around the ethics principles and the standards and things like that, how do you evangelize that and then distill that down to something practical that a procurement office can use to help them buy yeah. better software? Fantastic point. Um, and that is, again, uh, you're, you're, you're hitting directly the whole point of leverage. What we tell employees who effectively end up getting this, this hoodie here is that um, in every piece of work that they do, they have to be mindful of the fact that the DOD is counting on us to be able to scale AI in a way with a small team with very small resources. And so everything they do has to be built with leverage in mind. So let's take acquisition as a great example. Um, the Jake was the first organization at the DOD to take our policy. So we have a very strong policy team that is working on AI policies that we drive across the DOD. So what is our stance on, uh, many of you, um, uh, you know, in the audience may have or not, may not read the DIB report, which came out on AI ethics. Very, very actually great report. The Jake was took the report and we're now charged with actually operationalizing it. So what our team did is our policy team and our acquisition team and our missions team sat together and product team and said, we're gonna write the first, for the first time ever, take AI ethics and principles and put them into an acquisition document for the DOD. Because we don't have the luxury of sitting and just opining about policy, we have to make it real. Because this impacts industry, uh, what we put into acquisition actually impacts them in terms of the products they can deliver. So we have an iterate, iterative model of like working with industry off of that. But the communication went through our joint war fighting acquisition work that we did was the first time when we took principles, AI ethical principles, and try to bake them into, a, into an acquisition. Now I can tell you, it was not easy. It was messy. The lawyers hit back at us. The policy team uh, you know, was in there, the acquisition team, our missions team was pushing back because we'd never get a contractor to ever agree to those part of the creative tension that we have to deal with because who else is going to deal with it we're we're paid money to go do this so what happened is we uh, ended up actually not making it a requirement but put it in the informational section but that was just the first step 
So now what happens is, is the J keeps pushing and pushing and pushing these things deeper and deeper into the model. We now have an artifact of way to do it that we can then export to every single acquisition in the DoD. If they're acquiring AI products, this is the way you would integrate AI ethics and policy into an acquisition document. So fantastic example of together abstract policy with missions, with acquisition into an actual product that we're gonna deliver out uh, to the DOD. And that becomes, again, a proud way of saying we created leverage because we don't have to do this a hundred times across the DOD now. Yeah, it's a, re a real way to drive change at an enterprise level. Absolutely. You know, and, and drawn from that, you know, you talk about your background in Silicon Valley and spending a couple decades plus out there. Um, you know, for you coming in, what was sort of the biggest cultural shock, right? Coming from Hit Valley, wearing the hoodie, to coming into big, slow-moving DOD. You know, what, <laughs> what caught you off guard the most? Uh, well, do you want to, is it just one or do I get like 40 of them? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, here, here uh, there, there, were, there were a couple of things that I think were interesting. Number one is the idea that government, you know, the, the, it's, it's all the normal uh, charges levied against the government. It's slow, it's bureaucratic, it's this, it's that, everything. Okay. You know, uh, first and foremost is this has probably been the toughest job that I've ever had um, because of the size and complexity of the organization. Uh, you know, communication and interlock uh, doesn't grow linearly with size, as we know, right? That if you double the size, it, you know, it, it, it squares the sort of amount of work. So at this scale, the level of coordination and interlock is just absolutely insane. And so um, shock one was just how, how the scale and size of it was shocking. Second is, is people, the, the, the mission of the DOD is unlike any other tech or startup company. So even though we think of the Jake as a startup, it's not a startup in the traditional way because you're, you're impacting an organization of the size and scale, but at the, at the tip of this is war fighting. I mean, we cannot get away from the fact that ultimately there are situations that result in, you know, things happening, physical, kinetic things actually happening. And the joke that I have is, especially for AI, when you actually look at this sort of second uh, coming of AI, if you may, right? I, I went to school in computer science in the, in the late 80s when we thought we were doing AI, right? With Lisp and trying to model the brain. And you know, if you look at the the this uh, renaissance that's happened in AI coming back, a lot of it has been driven by commerce, right? It's it's clicking on ads and big data and all the other pieces because of compute and other things. But but that that was a driver. So my joke is is you know if if uh, my wife and I you know go to Netflix and and find one of the recommended movies and you know my wife turns to me and she's like, this movie really sucks. You know, that's just a bad movie night, right? And, and you know, we'll prob she'll, she'll probably be unhappy with the choice. Or if I bought something on Amazon that was recommended, but it turned out to be a really stupid product, right? Those are consequential, but they're not as consequential as uh, an AI system messing with targeting or Intel or other things there. So the bar is so much higher in terms of delivery and test and uh, you know, the thoughtfulness that goes into deploying tech. So we, we can't be cavalier about it. And there are reasons why there's layers of bureaucracy and thinking. Uh, AI, for instance, a very, you know, data hungry. So we had a project called Project Salus that we built to support Northcom on supply chain disruptions. Well, one very key legal issue is, you know, we at the DOD cannot handle personal information of U.S. citizens. It is the law. And not only good policy, but it's the law. Well, the level of attention to detail that's taken here to ensure that we comply with these rules and regulations, and there are many, um, is just extraordinary. But that requires us to take things a little slower and a little more deliberate than we would in, in the commercial land. Yeah, so, and it's, it's, it's interesting to hear you talk about sort of the, the data hungry aspect of it that's often mm -hmm. overlooked as, as folks are talking about artificial intelligence and machine learning. There's this assumption that you sort of, you turn Watson on and it's telling you where to shoot your three-pointer from, and you don't have to sort of raise it like a small child for a while first. 
Um, if you look at sort of the enterprise and some of the challenges with data, both overclassification, stove piping and segmenting, and then from a quality standpoint, you know, as a former military guy, we often, you had to enter in your data and do reports and it was a compliance drill and you just kicked it in so you could go do whatever. How are you working to reconcile that and, you know, wrangle that data so it's meaningful and we can actually start to apply different models to it and solutions? Right. No. And the answer is not easily. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, you you literally rattled off every single problem that we have with it. You know, it's it it's well, a lot of it is just thrown away today. Um, the stuff that's not thrown away is siloed. It's on um, hard drives. It's uh, completed completely. There's no metadata. Uh, there, there's no correlation. I mean, it. so so every problem. Now, the good news is we have a chief data officer now that we just hired, Dave Spurk. Uh, phenomenal guy, just totally awesome. Uh, the Jake and him work side by side, completely interconnected because we're data hungry and data thirsty. And he's all about uh, policy uh, and issues in terms of solving many of those problems. And, and so we're, we're tying this together, the JCF. So the, the way, um, I'll, I'll just kind of give a quick sort of piece here is, um, Artificial intelligence and AI is not a singular thing, right? It is it is a mishmash of statistics and math and algorithms and other pieces there, of course, and it's completely verticalized. So you can't say AI for full motion video and AI for predictive maintenance and AI for cyber are similar. They're not, they're completely different things. Doing image recognition for you know objects on, on a map versus, you know, again, predicting an engine failure um, are at different levels of maturity also in the government. As you know, we, we the government, you know, we're not going to build these products. Industry has is, is got the best talent. They are innovating fast. Our job is to how do we leverage those products to bring them in. So when it comes to things like numerical data and other things, we believe in other areas like NLP, for instance, these are areas that are well-established, uh, you know, performant algorithms, large selection of vendors to choose from, et cetera, we believe those to be scaled. Yep. So as the Jake's job is really how to get our data situation into under control so we can feed these commercial algorithms and hope to bring on commercial companies to help solve that problem. But then it comes to things like FMV or uh, you know other areas where we are still way behind on the on the technology sort of curve. And that's where we have to deal with both the data and the algorithms. And that's an area where we're sort of starting to focus. And then the last thing I'd say is uncovering the customer need, the control points, um, you know, when it comes to things like command and control or logistics or things like fires or targeting, those are areas where we need to uncover and understand what are the key pivot points where we can apply AI, these commercial algorithms and systems with the correct data to apply those into those pivot points in a strategic way. Yeah, you know, you, you talk about sort of the the leverage points in, you know, from a C2 standpoint, from the cultural sort of side of it, there's been, you know, historically uh, an unwillingness or a reticence to share some of that data um, yeah. coming up through DOD, both from a trust factor and from a no, this is mine, I need to protect it. How do you start to think about the incentives and not, not traditional Silicon Valley, like, you know, you, you click the ad, share your data, you get 10% off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But think about, think about that actual end user. You know, we talk about war fighting functions. That end user is four or five echelons removed away from, you know, the Jake. So you're going through a bunch of customers and sort of ombudsmen, so to speak. Yeah. And then you get to the end user and you need that end user's data. So that yeah. turns into what? Probably 20% more time in their day by the time you layer on each echelon's additional requirement. Yeah. How do, how do we start to, to incentivize that or change that culture to get you good, real practical data? Yeah, no, so actually uh, you beautifully brought it back to the uh, to the core um, topic of the summit is you know platform one and JCF and infrastructure. Yeah. So when you go out and talk to the, uh, I don't wanna say there's an average developer at the DOD, <laughs> but there is an incredible hunger for people to get access to compute and data and storage to actually go. Because 
you know, this is not Soviet style planning where there's going to be a single organization that does AI or, or development for the DOD. Our job is to democratize this in the widest possible way because the next generation of warfare and what the DOD needs to operate uh, is software based, right? Is the, the better we are at software. I mean, I'm a big believer in, you know, software is eating the world. And the DOD is not immune to this. So we're going to digitize every part of war fighting. What that means is that the average developer getting access to compute, infrastructure, et cetera, is one part. So that's what Platform One, Cloud One, et cetera, infrastructure teams are helping us with. With the JCF, curated and labeled data becomes the cheese that attracts the mice. And what ends up happening then is the the you know the attractiveness there becomes it becomes a community aspect to this right which is if you have um, like for instance we did work with the the you know SOCOM on engine health for instance now they know uh, through this AI process development process that the more data they got the better off their models would be and so by aggregating data if they share and everyone else shares the community then benefits from getting a better engine health model for all of the Black Hawk helicopters that use the same engine. Yep. And so the aggregation and re-leveraging of labeled data and labeling becomes key because labeling is an insanely expensive and hard task. Yeah. Getting cleared labelers with pack cards to come in. So one of the other aspects is labeling as a service, but who wants to do labeling if they can get ready-made curated data sources that are ready in the JCF. And as part of the price of admission could be, you have to add data into the collective. That becomes an incentive. And then you give them compute development environments that are highly rich, but the entry into the community becomes one of sharing. We've now developed a community aspect of scaling this stuff up. No, and I, I, I love the, the ticket to enter is, is add to the data. You know, it's the nice. contributing in, what can raise all boats, right? It, it's, a, it's a trained model. Absolutely. It's a new data set. It's something like that. Right. Um, and, and one thing to riff on, just one last point there, is we, we you know, we, um, our policy team is actually building this out in terms of personas of who are the people across the DOD. So we have a, around 11 or 12 different personas of people, all the way from commanders who need to now interact with probabilistic systems to, you know, a, a, uh, a business intelligence person sitting down and dealing with accounts, for instance. We have a project going on at the Jake to help with, uh, you know, for instance, unreconciled business transactions uh, for accounting, right? Applying AI to, 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 to bending that cost curve. Yeah. Now, what ends up happening is that um, you don't, you want a situation where the data is there, but then also the models themselves. So this idea of reusing software. So one of the other sort of core things that I, I, I think architecturally we need to change the DOD is not only just enabling AI, but this idea that uh, we don't need thousands and thousands of snowflake applications running across the DOD, right? Yeah. We now need to start building this concept of platforms, reusable platforms where the marginal code that you write on top is this small as opposed to having to vertically integrate your application from scratch. Yep. So again, another big change we need to, break to bring to the DOD over time. No, and that, and that leads to the next question perfectly, which is, you know, as you're talking about personas and bringing in some of that user design, how are you thinking about problem curation or challenge curation? And how are you mm. bringing it the same way we want folks to bring data or leverage this platform for scale? Right. There's this common misconception that AI can be applied to simply everything. And it's a magic, you know, sprinkle a little bit of AI on it. How do we actually start to prioritize and pick and test and see if we've got the right data, if we can curate and train the right models? Because mm -hmm. um, it doesn't solve everything. No, it doesn't. Um, you know, in all honesty, um, the, the data curation issue and the integrating the finished component or product into running systems, existing programs of record are actually the biggest challenges that our team have. Um, the AI, I, I, you know, other than very specialized parts of AI that are still under development and undergoing that commoditization curve, we found that the AI piece is actually not the issue. It's all the other stuff around it that's actually the issue. So we end up actually straying into, like you said, 
um, you know, integrating very deeply and tightly with the customer base, understanding their needs and requirements, explaining what AI can and can't do. And to point, you know, if you've got an end-to-end -end system like a command and control system or other things, you are right. We have to apply AI to the correct points in that entire chain. Um, but the entire system is not AI. And AI at different levels gets applied, right? Down from a, a tactical edge drone all the way to a cognitive uh, assistant to a commander or a predictive analytics platform, the class of AI and the type of AI applied at different different part of the process, but also at every level is very different. So uh, yeah, super it's, complicated. Yeah, I was just gonna say it's, it's definitely it's way more complicated than we can give it justice for too in this conversation. Indeed. Um, you know, from a talent standpoint and from a a broader sort of DoD culture. You know, you, you can look about every 10 seconds. I feel like I bump into a new DOD innovation shop that's doing something cutting edge yeah. and bringing emerging tech in. Yeah. So how is the Jake working on sort of wrapping its arms around, hey, what is that innovation ecosystem? What type of talent gaps exist? How are we working to sort of close them and make sure that we're not only evangelizing, but to your earlier point, you know, we're solving these problems and shipping product. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Um, it's hard, uh, and and the way we're so we take a very uh, you know it, it's it's very uh, unsexy to say that you know it's all about the meat and potatoes, right? But but it really gets down to that, which is you have uh, folks at the, in the DoD like DARPA that produce the you know really cutting edge new thing that's you know sort of ten years out. Um, but practically speaking, we have to be here and now. So what we're doing is um, we are organized, uh, as we said, we've got a policy team, we've got an entire plans acquisition and, and acquisition team, uh, we've got a products team, we've got a missions team, right? Those are the, the key active ones. Um, in each of these, there's a key skill set, right? So the missions team is about domain expertise. Um, so for instance, our Warfighter Health uh, AI team for missions is headed up by an actual practicing uh, thoracic, uh, you know, cardiac surgeon, right? He, uh, Captain Hassan Tete, you know, he sent me a, literally a, a image of what he was doing over the weekend. Um, while doing AI, he's actually saving people's lives, right? He's operating on people. So that's the level of domain expertise we have here at the Jake on one end to communicate and connect with that community. And then we've got um, a product team and there we're looking for, you know, your, your, your very typical sort of standard product manager. Now, uh, you know, because of the salaries and because of the talent war going on in the world, um, you know, we're not going to get the sort of person who wants to live in Silicon Valley and make, you know, a gazillion bucks in a short period of time. We're getting people who want to obviously serve the country. Uh, you know, want to want to learn uh, the the skill set. We've got some experienced folks, but we've also got you know folks who've never done product management before and are learning it. But they're learning from the more experienced ones. We've got a data and AI and science team that's stacked up with some amazing people, both senior and junior. But you know, we're we're accumulating talent. It is turning into a center of excellence over time. Uh, but I will admit, it's very hard. Uh, the talent wars are relentless. Uh, I used to deal with that as a startup, you know, founder and CEO sitting in Palo Alto and San Mateo, where, you know, uh, somebody who just signed on the dotted line last week just got a double offer from, you know, Google or Facebook and is off there. Um, but, you know, uh, you know, we're, 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 we're building it up and it's been, it's been absolutely, you know, great to see it grow from kind of what it was in 2018 to now what, uh, what it's become so. Yeah, no, the, the Google or Facebook reference gives me a chuckle. There are many a sad days where I thought I had somebody signed and then you'd hear, hey, Facebook just called. and Just called and yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but it, it, it gets down to the mission, right? It gets down to, to the mission. I mean, you know, where else or when else would you ever get a chance to be at the very beginning of transforming the Department of Defense with AI? Yeah. It's kind of a cool mission, right? It's, uh, awesome you know, mission. back... Um, I don't think a lot of people will get that chance to ever be here at the founding at the beginning. Yeah. And so that becomes sort of, that's our sort of, you know, ace uh, when we play it. Well, I remember talking to General Shanahan about the, hey, if you're passionate about getting this right, 
and you're passionate about it being used the right way. You know, we talked about the principles and the ethics and it was, hey, come in and build it the right way. Like now's your That's chance right. to, to really architect what this will be or won't be. Uh, right. It's almost a call to action. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Super. I couldn't be more excited. Awesome. Um, so I got to ask, I got to ask one tough question. Uh, oh my you know, God. We, we talked a bunch about Silicon Valley and wanting to bring and harness some of that innovation and bring that in. Yep. And then on the other side, you know, we see the first two large contracts go to very traditional, very traditional organizations. Yeah. Uh, I got to assume there's a plan underneath there of, of how to bring in some of that emergent tech. Can you share with us kind of oh, the yeah. vision for that and what that looks like? Absolutely. Um, I mean, the answer is actually very simple. Um, we, the Jake, are, again, a, we're a small organization. We're, we're, we're not an operations uh, organization, right, in the sense of, um, so let's take the two contracts you're, you're mentioning. One is the uh, joint warfighting contract, and the other is the joint common foundation contract. Uh, let me take them separately. So in the JCF's case, the joint common foundation, we just awarded to Deloitte, and we're super excited about partnering with them. Um, when the JCF gets deployed, it is going to get deployed on multiple clouds at different classification levels, dealing with all kinds of uh, developers coming in, both vendors, partners, inside, outside the DOD, with CACs, without CACs, uh, across different organizational boundaries, um, pulling in and integrating tens, if not hundreds of different pieces of data, libraries, toolkits, uh, open source products and commercial products. We needed a team to come in who is experienced in taking this incredible complexity, pulling it together and deploying and operating it, right? So the security ATO process, uh, getting through that, all of the requirements of lockdown, all the requirements of classification. The Jake does not have the talent or the infrastructure to do that because yep. we don't want to staff that up that is inherently a, something that we outsource to a complex, an integrator who knows how to deal with complexity, right? We just don't do that. So their job is not to build AI products. They're called a prime integrator for a reason is they integrate. What we're hoping and expecting, and very soon actually we're working because we have the, you know, every toolkit or product or other thing out there is absolutely welcome. And we want to provide with the JCF the richest possible environment of every great AI product that we possibly can send through the JCF and deliver to the developers. And like we said, we have these 11 or 12 different personas, right? All the way from somebody who just has a mound of data but is not a developer. They just, all they want is to visualize or uh, play with the data. So there's a certain set of tools there. All the way down to the hardcore programmer who says, I, I just wanna work with bare containers, with my hands on the keyboard and I just want to crank code, right? Get out of my way tools, get out of my way. I just want the command line. I want a container and I want to go deploy, right? So we have that entire spectrum. So the JCF is going to provide that and some obviously platform one and cloud one will provide at that keyboard level all the way to sort of high level AI. So, so that's the JCF integrator. Um, the joint warfighting integrator is a very similar vein, which is, uh, Booz Allen Hamilton is the is the integrator in that case. And for instance, um, I, I'm, I'm not going to stray into sort of classified land here, but um, we have certain projects uh, that you may have read about through the contracting process, et cetera, that deal with things like drones and hardware. Well, it's been a long time since I've glued a, 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 a board into, you know, a, into a drone, uh, you know, and, and sort of soldered it in and made sure the chips are right. But I can tell you it's not easy. Um, you know, I've actually seen one of these things. It's pretty big, um, you know. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and it costs a couple of million bucks. Yep. Uh, Booz and team bring that level of expertise in knowing how to actually get the entire chain done to take an AI algorithm and glue one into an actual tactical edge system that goes get tested out in the field. Um, and this is not one that my 13 year old will you know, pilot from there. It's complicated. <laughs> so this is where the integrators bring their expertise. And uh, you know, in my you know, uh, 26 years here in the Valley, uh, you know, back when I joined Sun Microsystems back in 1991, we actually built hardware in the Valley, right? 
Nowadays, we look more like Madison Avenue, right? We're just an advertising farm system here. We don't build hardware anymore in the Valley, right? We're asset light. We don't like touching these things that actually, nope. well, guess what? The DOD is full of hardware. Ultimately, the tactical edge is hardware with people. And so we need people who know how to pull this stuff off. And uh, that's why we have these. So it really isn't actually any more complicated than that. Very simple. No, that's that's an awesome answer. I appreciate you digging into that because I know <laughs> I know there were a bunch of folks that were like, oh, Silicon Valley guy. What is this? But that makes What is this thing? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, the Silicon Valley guy ain't gonna gonna uh, solder a board into a drone anytime soon. I'll tell you that yeah. much. <laughs> no, I, I see my kids keep running by, and you're making the jokes about robots. They were working on one downstairs. There's a fifty percent oh, chance okay. something's flying around the backyard. Get their uh, get their resumes in. Yeah, get them a small hoodie. Um, <laughs> so you know, we've got some questions coming in the chat here. You sure. know, one one of the questions came in about the personas for DoD customers, and if that's something yeah. that Jake can share. So that companies are starting to either build demos or think about product design that they'd be able to leverage, maybe not the full persona, but a partially redacted one that can help them better customize the products they're building for the Jake and for users. Is that something that might be possible in the future? Um, it's going to come soon. Uh, we owe uh, Congress a um, an actual answer to that question. It was actually a congressional directed uh, cause so good news is your representatives in Congress have exactly the same question. Uh, how do we train and educate our DOD workforce for this new technology? And as a part of that, our, our policy team, uh, led by Mark Beal and, and team did a fantastic job of, um, working with the services and, you know, who train, educate and others, uh, you know, our workforce coming up with these personas. Um, they're been, I can't share the report early because I think Congress gets to see it first cause they, they kind of paid for it um, and asked for it. But the benefit Congress, of being a customer. Exactly. I mean, I can't, you know, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're somewhat coin operated that way. Um, but we'll probably end up releasing this because it's not, I mean, it's not a secret. Uh, it's an incredibly well done report. It's still in the sort of draft phase. Uh, but when that happens, we'd love to, to share that with everyone. Awesome. Um, you know, as you're as you're looking forward, right? We're we're sort of in Jake 2.0 right now. You know, we we made yeah. the joke earlier about you know the work will never be done. But what yeah. are some sort of milestones that are just in your head, not codified as like Jake strategic goals, but as you start to think about what you want to be able to look at and say, hey, we we accomplished this. The Jake accomplished this. You know, yeah. What what does that look like for you? Wow, that's yeah. That, that, I think this is the tougher, toughest question actually to ask me here. <laughs> um, here's how I'd answer the question: um, Just like any other company, right? There is uh, when you start a company, you you have a vision in your head, um, and every successful company, you know that that wants to be, you know, goes on forever and ever, right? And so, so it reinvents itself, it changes itself. Well, one thing that General Shanahan uh, used to use a lot that I just absolutely love, and I'm going to use it here again, so I'll, I'll give him uh, a shout out. All credit to this... yeah. yeah, exactly. No, 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 no. Uh, he's a brilliant man. He came up with this idea. He was, we were talking about it, and he said, um, uh, do we have a Department of Electricity anymore? Right? Or if we were in prehistoric times, do we have a Department of Fire? Okay. So sitting around, the king says, where's my chief of fire, right? And the point is, is that we don't. Uh, I remember the days when uh, uh, mobile you know, phones came out and all of a sudden, every company had to have a mobile strategy, right? And we carved out our development team and said, you're in charge of the mobile strategy or virtualization. I remember that those days, right? Back in my VMware days, you had the Windows team and then you carved out the Windows team and said, you're the virtualization team now. Now, if you say, well, where's my virtualization team? Where's my department of electricity? Where's my department of fire? It doesn't. So we know that our end state is to eventually, there shouldn't be a department of AI at the DOD. Now, when and how that happens, I think, is something that we have to have these milestones, as you said. But we're so early on. I mean, you know, products aren't even viable or ready till they're 3.0. Yeah. Right. As the joke goes. Yeah. And so we're still at 2.0. So we still got a ways to go. 
But our end state that I think we should be, you know, hoping for is that being one of the few DOD entities that actually disbands itself when we feel that AI has arrived. Because our job, again, is to uh, enable AI, not to do AI per se. So we do just enough to learn and understand and teach. So for instance, we have the upcoming AI symposium, um, you know, uh, 9th and uh, September 9 and 10. So if those of you are for the DOD, you can sign up. There's still a couple of slots. I think we're capping it even virtually. Um, uh, but uh, for instance, our predictive maintenance team for the first time has a session on, because we did predictive maintenance work. We understand kind of the data issues. Oh my God, the, you know, um, uh, the single part call, being called 18 different things uh you know written down on a uh you know on a on a board or something that you can't even make out what it is we had to apply so much nlp so much uh you know cleaning up of the data to it this session at uh the symposium will not be about building an, a pmx product it will us the jake teaching everyone else how to go select a vendor do data cleanliness to do pmx because we want to get out of the pmx business predictive maintenance business we want the services and others to take this and, and deal with it. And we feel the technology is scaled. So go out and find a vendor, get your data ready, and bada bing, go and make it happen. No, I, I, lo I love the mindset of, it's almost the work yourself out of a job, right? If you can productize oh, yeah. yourself out of this, get out of it. Absolutely, exactly. That's outstanding. Just, and that, that's, a different, that's, a, that's a different uh, that's a different vantage point than a lot of the department, you know? So I think that's probably bringing some cultural change. And then as you, you know, as you talk about that mindset of, hey, we want to diffuse this capability out, empower yeah. the outstations, get out of the business of building and move on to that next problem. I'm sure there's no shortage of, you know, startups and entrepreneurs kind of right. trying to request time. What's the best way for them to engage with the Jake? Or very, 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 very easy. Um, AI.mil um, has our contact information on it. Um, there's uh, Doug Drakeley. We have uh, actually a, um, uh, a full-time industry relations, a full kernel out in Mountain View, co-located with DIU out in, uh, in Moffett Field. Uh, Doug is our entry point to the Jake. If you have a random sort of, you're a vendor who has a technology, who wants some attention, Doug is the guy who can guide you to the different NMIs or the JCF and other things uh, to intake you. We also have solicitations going out all the time. So for instance, um, let me just give you an example of a discussion we just had. Um, there are a number of startups that we've now looked at uh, in the AI policy and ethics field, right? So for instance, things like AI explainability is actually a very, very hot topic, right? So our policy team comes back and says, uh, can we get products that actually enable us to get to the root of explainability, right? So there's a bunch of startups doing work there. We're not going to do research in it. The Jake's job now is to figure out the four or five or six different companies doing work in this space. How mature are they, right? Is this still research or is it, I, I have a, a slide which I call the R and the D meter, right? Is it R or is it D? If these products are more, we can bring them in, maybe add them as part of the JCF or take them through the ESG process, which is DOD wide, and start socializing these startups as a means of doing that. Similarly, uh, synthetic data generation, another very interesting area that we're starting to look at. Well, it works well with a lot of numerical data. So things like, for instance, healthcare, where you need anonymized data so you can work with vendors, uh, disclose AI. Um, but it won't work, for instance, in, in video. Uh, synthetic data generation right now in video is still a research project. Uh, synthetic world generation, for instance, to do AI training, for instance. Mm -hmm. So the Jake's role is to be a center of excellence to know what's what's going on, what's research, what's not, things like deep fakes, synthetic data generation, AI policy, et cetera. Separate out R versus D and then focus on the D, get it scaled, get it operationalized, move out of the way on to the next thing. Yep. That's and that's I love the the, the R versus D. I'm probably going to steal that. I will of course give credit because that's a great way to break that down. 
I was going to say, is it 1.0 or 3.0? Because it's the same, no, no, no. <laughs> same sort of thing. Like, uh, you know, as, as you're talking about sort of these solicitations and the work that Doug's doing out in Silicon Valley and guys, guys watching, if you don't know Doug, go meet Doug. Doug is fantastic. Doug is awesome. Uh, Doug is awesome. But where, where should folks be looking? Because I know there's a bunch of people in the chat. Is it DIU? Is it on the Jake yeah. webpage? Is there thinking about, because everyone wants to, they want to get a shot to get a hoodie. They want to figure out how to work with you guys. Yeah. <laughs> you get the hoodie if you win the contract. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, everything we do is completely 110% transparent. So we publish every, you know, given the size and scope of the inbound, um, we have to give everyone a shot, a level playing field and a shot. So even if you get good, get to be good friends with Doug, uh, or if you don't meet Doug, you still get a chance, an equal chance of get, getting a shot at it. So every area and piece of procurement we do, we publish that. Now, we have a very strong partnership with DIU, um, but we also have other outlets. So, for instance, GSA, DS, uh, you know, DITCO, uh, DISA DITCO, DIU are our primary acquisition uh, partners. Uh, we're working on some really interesting stuff we're going to unveil in the next couple of months that will actually even make it friendlier and easier for the smallest little teensy weensy startup to somehow figure out how to work with the Jake um, and have a shot at acquisition and other pieces there. So hold that thought there. But in the meantime, DIU is a great way to go. Uh, if you need to connect with the Jake, if there's an acquisition work we're doing with them, and if not DIU, you know, Jeff Klugman, uh, Mike Brown, they have a direct line into the Jake. If there's a, a startup, a piece of technology that they know of that they want to highlight to us, it comes straight to us. I mean, uh, I'm shocked at how how level, how flat uh, all of this stuff is, and and that's why you know, unfortunately, we're having to work 24 seven because the inbound <laughs> is insane. But um, but but that's our job. That that's what we're here to do. Yeah, it's a, it's a good problem to have. You know, having that many folks want to come in. So I'm gonna transition. We've got you know a few minutes left here. I want to transition to sort of a different segment of the audience. Okay. Uh, you know, you've had a pretty impressive career. Very impressive career. You know, done Silicon Valley. You've done a bunch of great stuff academically. You're now running the Jake. You know, we've got young soldier sailors, airmen, and Marines out there watching. We've maybe got some folks who are in school right now, getting into their first sort of lines of code they're slinging. What do you look at them and, and give them as sort of guides as they're thinking about, hey, how do I make it? How do I make yeah. it to here where I'm driving at a national security level with this technology? Yeah. yeah. What's that advice to that younger generation? Wow. Um, okay. Uh, um, this is Sorry. the, uh, <laughs> no, 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 I guess this is the part of the conversation where the gray hair comes in, uh, hopefully comes into, uh, some play here. Um, the, the way to think about this is that first and foremost is, and this sounds very trite and I apologize, but, but I'll try to weave in sort of some, some, some aspects of it is, um, knowing how to code alone. So. In your career in life, you can choose a number of different, you know, possible pathways, right? Obviously, the hope and expectation is, is that whatever pathway one chooses, that they will rise to sort of the top most levels of whatever they want to choose for. So if you're choosing a technical track, for instance, one of the big pieces of advice I'd give is um, I'm seeing a lot of, and I see my kids do the same thing, but I see their, the, you know, there is a big difference between coding and architecture. And one of the things that I'm finding is a lot of people getting confused that just learning code alone is good enough to make it. Um, but having you know, been sort of trained in computer science is a very different notion than being trained in, trained in coding. The beauty is, is that coding is so much more accessible today, right? So again, systems like Platform One make it so much easier to get something out and deployed. But one always has to think through the issues of architecture. So one of the things I push our team very, very hard on is it's okay to do sort of points of light products and things, but you have to think of the system as a whole. So up-leveling and doing that meta thinking on that side. Similarly, if you're in the government and you're thinking of taking a, a more of a sort of leadership track on that front, the thing that strikes me the most here is the 
connecting one's thinking to business thinking. So in some sense, and I know this is a little bit controversial, but I'll say it nonetheless, is uh, when we think of operating the org, like we think of it as a business. How do you operate a business? Even though we don't have a PNL statement and we don't, you know, obviously have competitors in the traditional way inside the DOD, et cetera, but thinking of customers and customer service and servicing needs and getting into the mind of the customer and what they're trying to deliver, applying those basic concepts to the work that you do in government will completely change the way you build things, how you operate, the trade-offs that you make and other things there. So I would, I would push everyone very, very hard to try to sort of think in a much broader meta way. And the other is, you know, um, this aspect of sort of what I call Stockholm syndrome. Um, the same things that I talked about earlier in terms of the, the risk taking that you have, that we deal, deal with at the DOD. The other side of it is you can get paralyzed by your own constraints. And very often, sometimes, you know, not very often, but sometimes in meetings we'll have quite things like, this idea is so great, it must be illegal. <laughs> right? It's, that's my sort of joke there is that any idea that's just too good to be true can't possibly be true because it's like uh, what economists call finding a $20 bill on the sidewalk, which is, wow, nobody's ever thought of this before. How could this possibly be? And part of it is because people restrain their own thinking in terms of uh, self-limiting and other things there. Uh, one of the things that has been very helpful for me coming to the DOD is that, uh, you know, I'm at a point in my career, fortunately or unfortunately, where, um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm doing this for reasons that have, you know, that are very different from the reasons that I did many of maybe my previous work. And in that environment or situation, you don't really think about the consequences as much as you can think of the upside potential. And my, what I extort my team to do also, and we try to do our best is let's go for the highest possible outcome and then work our way down from there, right? Yeah. Find the biggest swing of the bat that we can do to outcome before something like predictive maintenance or humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, for business process automation or for product ethics or for acquisition. Think of the biggest game-changing thing that you possibly could do and then work your way on, you know, with the lawyers and the policy and the, the laws and other pieces there. But it's not worth wasting your time doing something in life unless you're going for the biggest possible, you know, swing. So that, you know, it, you know, a little bit of inspiration, but also a little bit of like, how can you make this happen here? So. No, oh, that's awesome. I appreciate that. And Molly has just jumped back into the uh -oh. window. Okay, Molly. It felt like the greatest time for me to come in and pretend like I might drop that. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome, you guys. Thank you so, so, so much. This was a fantastic way to end today-ish.